and for session. Um, I will now go back to Dr. Waters, who will um, share with us um, on some of the, the health needs. Jo uh, Dr. Waters? Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, 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 we yes, yes, can oh. hear you. Yeah. Okay, Sorry. good. Great. <laughs> I have to change headsets for some strange reason. So I'm going to talk a little bit about really um, the principal work that CBC does in the region, which is to work on HIV healthcare, um, and particularly uh, in terms of the minority groups that are most affected, MSM and trans women in particular. Um, and I'm going to present the results of a recent study just done at the end of last year um, that looks at care and treatment of people living with HIV and particularly MSM and trans women, or specifically MSM and trans women living with HIV in the Dominican Republic. And I think that many of the issues that come up you know, would be valid for any of the countries in the Caribbean. Um, but there are some particular uh, contexts that, are, that also um, result in, in an impact on, on access to healthcare that, that are particular to each country. And so in this case, the study looks at some of the challenges um, in the Dominican Republic, but they, they would be similar. Next slide. So basically, um, the that's right. Um, basically, this was a, a baseline study that was done for um, a, a social monitoring of services by uh, civil society groups, and we did a mixed methodology study that was conducted during lockdown. So it was conducted between October and November of 2020, and we had 33. Uh, key population, which in this case are specifically MSM and trans women um, who, were, who participated. Uh, we conducted 30 surveys and three focus groups each with eight participants. And then we also conducted uh, surveys and interviews with healthcare professionals. And we, we essentially looked at eight health services or eight health centers. Um, and these health centers had the, dis the distinctive um, feature that they were all supported by the US government. Um, some of these centers were um, public centers. So Centro Sanitario is a, is a public um, facility run by the Ministry of Health. Um, and so is another, uh, another clinic, which is Lotus y Servicios. Um, and the rest of them are actually NGOs, large NGOs, which offer uh, HIV care and treatment services, which um, are funded partly through the Ministry of Health in the Dominican Republic. But um, what makes all of these centers unique is that they all have additional funding specifically to support the work with um, high-risk groups, that's provided by the, um, the US government. Next slide. So here you can see how people self-identified. Um, the majority of people identified as being gay. Um, about a third uh, identified as being MSM. And, and that can look a little bit different in different countries. So a country like Jamaica, um, those who openly identify as gay is going to be smaller um, and you're going to have people who we have larger numbers of individuals who identify as MSM and I think that partly reflects in the more tolerant environment we don't have the same uh, British colonial laws um, so, so, so I, I think that you would see some differences but I think this this you know largely would also uh, be something you could see with different percentages throughout the Caribbean. Interestingly, 3.3% of individuals prefer to identify themselves as, as, uh, as an MSM um, or as, as uh, sorry, prefer to identify as a person living with HIV 
um, because they felt more comfortable with, the, with that than identifying specifically as MSM gay or a trans, a trans woman. Next slide. Um, we had uh, people from providers that were administrators in terms of the role within the organization. We had um, more or less an equal part, um, administrators, health providers and psychologists, and then um, you know, over 60% of them, of the respondents actually worked as a peer educator or a health navigator at a health center. Next. So essentially the US government funds um, these care and treatment sites, whether they're in the ministry or in an NGO um, to support uh, differentiated services for um, MSM and trans women um, am among some other groups as well, like sex workers and drug users. And I think this slide basically uh, shows that essentially there is a mismatch in terms of prevention, testing and support services um, between what the beneficiaries say they're receiving and what the um, providers say they're offering. So. In the yellow, essentially, you have what the provider says, and in the red, you have what the beneficiaries um, who are asked a, a question about the availability and um, being able to access these services. So, um, so for example, uh, with something like um, the distribution of IEC materials, so it, it, prevention information materials on HIV, 88% of the clinic uh, said they offered uh, or they distributed uh, IEC materials, but only 23% of the beneficiaries uh, actually received them. And, and so uh, that, that was a, this mismatch was really noted through across the board. Next slide. Um, when it actually came to care and treatment services, a similar pattern. So, um, you know, where the, the services that the providers are saying they're offering isn't necessarily what the, um, the beneficiaries are receiving. So in the case of trans healthcare, so stuff like horm hormones um, for transitioning, um, although 13% of the providers indicated that they provided those services, none of the beneficiaries um, had received them or were aware of those services. Next slide. So in terms of um, barriers, when, when we asked beneficiaries about what the principal barriers were to accessing services, 40%, um, so the highest percentage said that there was a general problem in terms of lack of knowledge um, and disinformation amongst healthcare providers, and that that was a, a, a huge issue that um, led to people going away from the center still with their health problem, um, or, or they felt that the service provider wasn't um, lacked knowledge, maybe in trans health or, or in LGBT healthcare, um, but they flagged that as a, as a principal issue and, and you can see there and like the other issues that were um, flagged and, and, and the second most uh, most mentioned issue was confidentiality there's a lot of concern that you'll uh, be outed if you go to a care and treatment site because of a lack of confidentiality at those sites next slide um, in terms of when we asked providers what they thought were the um, barriers that beneficiaries uh, faced, uh, they flagged transportation issues as the highest. So 75% um, of the providers said that, you know, traveling to the, the care and treatment site, and in many cases, you know, individuals travel um, to care and treatment sites that are outside of their communities, um, and then they flagged transport issues as the most common um, or the most frequent barrier and confidentiality and privacy issues were flagged at 25% um, you know, in terms of the providers. Next slide. 
Um, in, in terms of institutional barriers, um, lack of funding and lack of incentives for healthcare uh, uh, professionals were the two highest um, you know, flagged issues uh, from an institutional perspective. Next slide. So when we look at funding in the Dominican Republic, um, I mean, this captures in terms of the, 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 the individual funding of the size and, you know, about half of the participants or the providers did not have any idea as to where their funding came from. So of those that really did know, the vast majority of them, um, you know, that they did know something about where their finances came from, attributed um, the, the, the funding to come from international funding. And I think that's something which really needs to be flagged because the US government has been a real, um, a real, a really important contributor to the HIV response in the Dominican Republic and in many other countries in, in the Caribbean. The issue is that um, basically, like other donors, uh, USG is also pressing the government to step up um, to take over the funding of some of these services. And again, I'm really talking about services for key population groups like MSM and trans. Um, and that hasn't happened in the Dominican Republic. So in an area like prevention, um, which has traditionally been something that has been funded almost exclusively through uh, international funding. The amount that the, that the, um, the state contributes to prevention work with key populations in the Dominican Republic was reported to be 16% of the budget um, in the Dominican Republic last year. So, Essentially, it's meant that when the donors have withdrawn their support, and they basically have done this because as Caribbean countries move up um, on, the, on the scale, of the World Bank scale, and, and, and move from you know, lower income to upper and, or upper middle income countries, the expectation is that the government uh, will take over more of the funding uh, for these these essential services, but that hasn't happened. And, and it hasn't happened because of the lack of political will, that these populations are not a focus, et cetera. Um, and, and so this has really precipitated a crisis in the Dominican Republic. And it's, you know, when you take into consideration that a lot of the funding has come from uh, the US government organizations in the past, um, and, and what's happened is essentially USG has decided to focus their support on migrants and, and basically on Haitian migrants because we share an island with um, Haiti and we have a large number of Haitians who cross the border um, to work, to access health care. And so the, 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 the US agencies have basically said, well, we can continue to support the response, but just with migrants. And unfortunately, that's had a whole series of repercussions within the general response um, because of the fact that when you support one group um, over another, and particularly if the group is a migrant group, um, it can actually trigger some unexpected um, uh, it has so many unexpected impacts. And, and I you know, would argue that it's actually contributed to stigma and discrimination amongst migrant groups because first of all, they've, um, they've really incremented the number of individuals who are uh, arriving at the care and treatment sites. And that's a good thing because those individuals were not accessing care um, I mean, care and treatment here for HIV is something that is open. So, you know, migrants from Haiti have access, but in practice, you know, um, often they're reluctant to, to attend because they fear that somehow they're going to get registered and 
the Dominican Republic doesn't exactly have a very good record on its treatment of, of Haitian migrants. Um, so, so essentially, this program that's been supported by the, the US government often doesn't take into account sort of a, a whole series of historical issues in terms of migrants from, from Haiti. And the, the fact that many of the, the, the most vulnerable groups and the most impoverished populations have often really resented the fact that they have to share services with migrants who come across from Haiti. And so that, that's often something which is very difficult for somebody who, you know, who, who also doesn't have enough money to, to come to, for the transportation into the office um, or into the health center. They see that the migrant receives all kinds of incentives. And so they feel resentment based on that. The, the large number of individuals or, of migrants who are coming into the, 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 the treatment sites that are called SIES um, have led to a real op overpopulation because there's been no compensation in terms of the number of healthcare providers. And so that's really contributed to the overwork and the demotivation of healthcare providers because they need to see, in many cases, two or three times as many patients with this new focus on migrants. And so, I mean, I think this has all led to, to some unexpected consequences. And of course, when these migrants enter the services, um, the, 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 the health net navigators who used to support all the people living with HIV in the centers have been replaced by individuals who have the distinctive characteristic that they can speak Creole, because obviously that's critical in doing outreach migrants but they don't have the experience or the knowledge of the seasoned navigators who have all been replaced because there's no funding to support them. And so that's really led to some challenges within how the, the treatment sites work. And so ironically, there's large numbers of Haitians that are now coming to the, um, to the services due to all of these incentives, but the adherence and uh, the other uh, factors that make the clinic a supportive uh, space have, have been really weakened by this practice of supporting the migrants. Um, and, and of course, when you put this in the backdrop um, of what's been happening in the Dominican Republic with migrants and um, it, it, it means it can it can cause bad feeling um, by other people living with HIV uh, when when they see this this preferential care and treatment. So so essentially that is my presentation, um, and I think you know what it really underlines is that you know sometimes well-intentioned um, assistance can end up um, being problematic. Uh, if if the circumstances uh, you know are, are not more favorable with the other people living with HIV, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, I think you have covered in that presentation a range of issues which I think are common across all of the presenters, uh, but reflected in the Dominican Republic space. Uh, we will move quickly because I'm mindful of time. Uh, we'll move quickly now into the presentation from Ray.